ZPAC, Dr. Z, Dr. Marty McCary. You are professor of what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Johns Hopkins in the School of Medicine, in the School of Public Health, <laughs> in the School of Business. You're a professor. Who does that? Only a gunner. I okay. brought you a little gift from the Johns Hopkins right there in case you um, are you, concerned before your sixth booster. You brought me a mask <laughs> at the end of a pandemic. I only give them to people with at least six boosters and <laughs> two different vaccines. Marty, I'll have you know, I've gotten the Sinovac the Moderna, the <laughs> Pfizer, the AstraZeneca, the Johnson & Johnson. I got Novavax because I was in the trial. <laughs> Sputnik. I got Sputnik. <laughs> Sputnik. I got all right, all then the you're versions. covered. Then you're covered with right? the Sputnik. That kind of clears out the last 2% of infections. It kind of does. <laughs> and I double mask, okay. okay? And I'm in a hermetically sealed bubble right now that you can't see. Um, thanks for the mask, dude. You, you know, it's funny. So you, you, you've been the pandemic superstar as far as I'm concerned because you've been right about everything. We're gonna talk about that. But I, I always say this, your book, The Price We Pay, which is a must read, you guys. Like I, we did a show about it when it came out in hardcover a couple of years back. It's out in paperback when? Shortly? Uh, yeah, June 8th. Yeah, it's coming out June 8th in paperback, second edition. The last one was a year and a half ago. This has a COVID update and a follow-up in every section. Okay, this book is about how we basically fix healthcare, period. End of story, full stop. It's one of the most powerful. If you don't read it and get super pissed, you're not a human being and you need to be excommunicated from this race of people, <laughs> all right? Um, that all being said, we got that out of the way. Here's the key thing. You, I hate you. I've been wrong too, by the way. Oh, come on, what? You picked the wrong like <laughs> socks one day? Like what? <laughs> what have you been wrong about? Start with that, then we'll say what you've been I thought right I about. was the, the second most humble person in the world. <laughs> Turns out I'm the most humble person. <laughs> <laughs> you are such a surgeon and I love you. So, okay. I am a surgeon, but just so before we get started, my preferred pronouns are <laughs> supporter of the z -Pack tribe. So, those are the only pronouns I will allow you to listen your email. <laughs> And on Twitter, oh my God, what a great idea. My pronouns are z -Pack supporter, slash -Pack, supporter. Yes, member of the tribe. You, okay, I pitched your book and you pitched my supporter tribe. We're now, let's I'm just- a, I'm a supporter, I'm not, it's it real, man. Mm -hmm. You can check my subscription. Check it before you wreck it. Check it. <laughs> <laughs> so Marty, here's the thing. Okay, you've been all over the news. You write op-eds. You've been a major voice on the pandemic and you've taken so many arrows for what ultimately turned out to be the correct advice. So let's start at the beginning. I like to push the field. Yeah, you do. And I like to, uh, it's funny because a lot of the times that you had come out with something, I would initially disagree and be like, that doesn't, that's not right. And then I'm proven wrong. And that's good to have a healthy conversation. We, we That's how we used to do things before the political entrenchment. Right? Yeah. But I would never go, well, Marty's an evil person for <laughs> saying this, but that's what they do. So this, let's see what you're an evil person for saying that turned out to be right. In the early pandemic, you said, hey, this is a real pandemic, guys. Like, this is not a joke. Um, this is actually gonna be bad. And people were like, oh, you shut up, you fear-mongering Johns Hopkins epidemiology public policy guy. Yeah, took a lot of arrows. I, I mean, late February, early March, Scott Gottlieb and I went on a lot of networks, a lot of cable news networks, wrote a lot of pieces, wrote one in MedPage today, saying this, we need to abandon the idea this is contained. What happened in Italy is going to happen in the United States and hundreds of thousands of people will die, maybe more if we don't take it seriously. And you know what's crazy is at the time, I was like, you know, this feels like we're overblowing this. I, I kind of believe in CDC and AWHO, they're gonna control this. Like science will win, it's okay. It's probably just flu with a little extra mortality. American exceptionalism. Yes, yes, yes. Our immune system is exceptional. <laughs> ever, since, <laughs> ever since July 4th, 1776, we have more T cells and more B cells yeah. than the rest of the world and combined. And more obesity and more disabled, more medicated, more hospitalized people than anyone, you, you any just, country You just world. stop that right, you shut your mouth. Exceptional. Okay, you come here from Egypt and you tell me my country doesn't have B cells. Right. Um, but no, no, but you, good memory. You, <laughs> you had actually said at the time, listen, I think we should have universal masking. And you know, people like Michael Osterholm were saying masks are dumb. I was saying cloth masks are probably a bad idea because we're gonna be touching our face and the public is too dumb to figure out how to use masks correctly. And, and you were like, no, universal masking, it'll save lives. Yeah, and it took a lot of heat for this. So that was um, a New York Times piece that went viral in uh, mid-spring, right when the pandemic was, um, was bad. Mm. And nobody you know, was talking about masking 
in a, in sort of a universal way. So I wrote this piece in the Times calling for universal masking. Took a lot of criticism for it, among, yeah, yeah. even among doctors, a of lot course. of physicians. Yeah, because we, um, we, we we were also like, hey, well, let's stop in, instilling panic. Like patients are gonna be wearing masks on their face and wearing gloves to the supermarket. What the heck? And of course- And you know, when you put something out that radical, I gotta be honest with you, you get a little nervous. Maybe I'm wrong, right? Because that was based on not not hard randomized trials, right, of course. but the empirical observations of Chinese doctors Johns Hopkins, the infectious diseases department, several doctors had a conference call with doctors in Wuhan at the hospital early in January when they were going through their really bad thing. And those doctors had a very clear message to the to us, and that was, please urge everyone to wear a mask. Wow. And so I followed, and I called a lot of doctors over there, and I was trying to understand it. And they were saying, look, it pretty amazing. It was contained in Wuhan in a country of 1.2 billion, how did they do that? The whole country masked up and some other things, draconian Major lockdowns, lockdowns yeah. <laughs> welding people in their rooms. Right? Yeah, uh, hiding all the data. Yeah, I mean, all yeah. the other things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's a small cost right. for a potentially big benefit, right? Right, so, right, right. And Korea did it and other countries that got burned with MERS. Right, and you said it actually, I remember in those op-eds, you said, you know, could you actually listen to the Chinese doctors? Like, what is this kind of like weird, kind of xenophobia that we have about listening to our colleagues in a different country that happens to have a different political system. And it's not a revelation, right? It's not like the the Jordan River part. What happened was SARS-CoV-2, which is COVID-19, spreads exactly like SARS-CoV-1. <laughs> Guess what? You know, it's not that big of a rev revelation, right, aerosolized right, virus. Right, right. Well, that was a that was a brave thing to do. And I think the truth is you can have dissent, right? You can say, oh, now actually that's wrong and here's why I think so, the lack of data and so on. I mean, you're saying, well, no, the precautionary principle are our experience in China. And, and it turns out, I think you were absolutely right. And Monica- And Gan that debate is good, right? We should oh, be having that debate. thousand percent. Not political entrenchment and battle. And, and this is the thing, and then admitting when you had the you were on the wrong end of the debate, right? Like early on, I was like, oh, I think masks are a bad idea for the public. Like for, for hospitals, absolutely, we need to save it all for them. And I was also kind of concerned that we're gonna all the masks are gonna to go to the Joe Blow who's at low risk and then our frontline healthcare staff that are uh, dying. And that was my, one of my concerns. But Monica Gandhi on the show convinced me, she was like, no, this inoculum theory, it's like terrific. a real thing, yeah. So you gotta update your prior data set and then change your mind. And then you have to also own when and why you were incorrect. So it's not like a judgment thing, like, oh man, I was wrong. I, I'm the worst, I'm a worthless piece of crap. So therefore I'm gonna deny it and project confidence. No, you go, yeah, I was wrong because science is hard. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not sports betting in Vegas. It's not like you, you pick your team, you cheer them on, and then you know you trash talk the other team, and then you're just a massive letdown if you don't win. We, sh we need to evolve our strategy and thinking when the data changes. When the data changes, absolutely. So you, you did that. Then about summertime, you were like, hey guys, just FYI, Winter's gonna suck because <laughs> you're just looking at these numbers. This is the calm before the storm here. Yeah, snowflake before the blizzard was the piece, yeah. Snowflake before the blizzard. And when, when did you write that and in what place did you write that? I don't remember, but I went on cable news saying that repeatedly, basically like, let's brace up. Right. People were like, you know, in these uh, TV interviews, have we learned lessons? This is right after the fall initial outbreak. Have we learned lessons for future pandemics in future years? I'm like, we haven't even learned our lesson three months. For can't even remember for three months how bad you know. It's like forget about future pandemics right now. Yeah, we're not even through this yeah. one. So what are the lessons for twenty? Yeah, one hundred microbial when... twenty fifty. Yeah, you know, increase in AMR. <laughs> so and you were saying things that were actually it's interesting because you're on a lot of networks that span the political spectrum. Mm -hmm. you, you go on, if you go on Fox News and say, you know what, the winter's gonna be really hard, you better mask up. Did you get pushback on those kind of networks? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm used to it. But yeah, you know, um, a lot of people wanted to speak up, I found out. Mm -hmm. So I talked to a lot of doctors around the country. They either didn't have a vehicle to do it, right? or they were afraid because it would be seen as they're, in, they're representing their institution's position. Mm. So they would always tell me things like, you know, I agree with that, but I, I just can't say anything because of my institution. It'll look right. like X university is saying this. Right. I'm like, this is the problem, not just in the pandemic, in all of healthcare, people are afraid to speak Terrified. up. When you see something that seems wrong, that it's gonna affect people, 
people are going to die. You got to speak up. You got to do something. We need more of that. I agree. I agree. And so you you were willing and able to do that and be That's avoid. why I'm a big fan of ZPAC, by the way. Hey, what can I say? Oh. Keep pitching that and I'll just be like, and guys, by the way, the price we pay coming has, out in paperback, has, June 8th. <laughs> has anyone ever accused you of not speaking your mind? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. no, in fact, that's, no, that's not true. The anti-vaxxers accuse me of speaking pharma's mind and not my own mind, which secretly knows that these vaccines are toxic poisons. I think you enjoy the anti-vaxxers riding you. I love them. It's kind of like a, a love, hate, love thing. Cause I'm like, you know, I kind of like their style of questioning everything, even though they're, it's delusional. It's, it's a good practice for like, skepticism. The problem is it's delusional, intransigent skepticism that's not <laughs> convincible, but at least it challenges your ideas. Remember you said earlier, he's like, well, what, you know, what, what, what if I could be wrong? Like, what does that feel like? Yeah. Well, in a way it should feel like, okay, good, I'm wrong. What can I learn from this? What am mm -hmm. I going to do next? Mm -hmm. what, how do I check? What other beliefs of mine are probably not serving me that are incorrect? So you kind of said, okay, the fall is going to be a surge. And then when the fall surge happened and FDA was starting to say, okay, EUAs are starting to be processed for these vaccines. You went on the war path again with flapping your big old mouth hole talking about <laughs> FDA. What did you say about FDA? Yeah, so they get the Pfizer application, the Moderna application, and they schedule a meeting of their experts three weeks later. It's like, hello, 2000 <laughs> Americans are dying a day. How about we move that up a little bit? And by the way, it's not that complicated of an analysis. It's 44,000 people in a database where you basically have zero adverse events. And the FDA, contrary to what people think, they're not looking under the microscope. They're not interviewing volunteers from the phase three trial. They get an application and they read it. Can you read a little faster? Don't cut any corners on your process. But scheduling that meeting three weeks out for such a simple analysis, it was like, you know, I got, I have insiders at the FDA and they tell me, you know, nothing's happening. You know, we're, we're basically, it's, it's dark over Thanksgiving. Uh, they're frustrated. They're angry. So they're giving me the information uh, as I'm getting frustrated saying, look, I'm going to speak out about this. Can you tell me anonymously what's going on behind the scenes? So um, those, you know, there are a lot of people adamantly defended the FDA who know nothing about the process. Couldn't even tell you how many pages the application is or what the application is asking for. And, and remember, this is not like an um, academic exercise. Thousands of people are dying per day. Right, and they and people are perceiving my criticism to say, cut corners on the approval. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, of course. No, yeah. don't cut corners. Do the same analysis. By the way, we're analyzing data every day in our, my research team. A, an analysis like that, I could have four different statisticians do an independent review of that data set and get you a result within 48 hours. With a medical student bringing you coffee, Q2 hours, <laughs> right? Easily, easily. And I'm just saying there's one role for medical students and that's gopher. Go for some more coffee for me. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's true. And so you were saying that then when- And it gets, so they, the experts meet, they approve unanimously, right? They're like, okay, when are we gonna vote? Okay, finally we get to vote, vote unanimously. Then there's two days that pass. And so the people defending the FDA say, oh, they have to take their time, make sure it's all of you know, their safety. What's going on two days after the unanimous vote by the experts? They have to get it notarized. They have to get it notarized, <laughs> find a stapler, give it to Betty. She passes it on to the Department of Plain English. There's a fact. <laughs> <laughs> There's a fax involved. Meanwhile, another yeah, 4,000 people are dead. Right? Yeah, 6,000. I calculated in those two days, 6,000 Americans died. Uh -huh. And so the, the, those who defend the FDA say, well, it's just two days, you know, it's just processing time. <laughs> how about making an analysis? How about a sense of urgency, you right, know? Right, 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 right. And, and by the way, a lot of people at the FDA were like, please keep pushing us because they can't speak up there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then we got into a situation where there was another Marty special. And this Marty special was, and I say this with the, because you were right. Um, hey, why are we vaccinating young people who just happen to be like healthcare administrators or something that yeah. don't touch patients? Yeah, the first people to get the vaccine. I mean, how can you? How do you look at this and not say something? Some of the v people to get it the first week it's out there. A twenty-five-year-old media relations hospital worker who's working from home, uh, accountants, spouses of hospital administrators, hospital board members. <laughs> I'm on a hospital board myself. I was offered nice. the vaccine as a part of that. And so- Did you take it? Uh, no, no. Uh, I, and I wrote, I wrote a piece in MedPage yeah, titled- I think I read that. Why I'm not going to get vaccinated right, right now. Right, right, right after a whole summer of, of Black Lives Matter, all of a sudden here, 
people with wealth and influence and power insert themselves and cut themselves in line ahead of those who are at greatest risk, basically saying my life matters more. Are, are you an anti-vaxxer? Because that's what it fucking feels like to me. <laughs> no. You take your mask and you get out. <laughs> I, um, I love anti-vaxxers, but I disagree with them. <laughs> <laughs> so you were advocating that we go on an age-based, which is risk-based thing, give it to the elders first. Now, who did that and it turned out to work out? Well, uh, some a bunch of states did it, right? And yeah. um, and the Brits. And the, so the Brits said, "Look, let's do the first dose first, right? Yeah, let's focus on first doses." And that's oh, that was the other thing. First dose, just give that first dose. So you had a good analogy for this with like life preservers or something, right? Yeah. Like, so look, if if um, <laughs> if you've got twenty life preservers and two hundred people swimming in the ocean, okay, <laughs> and you've got a you know a case fatality rate of COVID, why give two life preservers? <laughs> to one person, you've got a scarce resource. I mean, in the science of rationing, which by the way, the government knows nothing about. Right, but the UK knows about it. <laughs> UK did it well, they're very familiar with rationing, right? And they did it well, they did this. They delayed the first, second dose to 12 weeks so as many people could get that incredible protection of the first dose. And right. it is incredible, and right. I don't say that to downplay the second dose. 92% efficacy at four weeks, published in the New England Journal of Medicine mm. for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines at four weeks, just from the first dose. Mm. That's pretty good. Yeah. Okay, when people are dying left and right, let's focus on first doses. Yeah. And so why would you give two life preservers to one person at that time? Well, because you go from 94 to 97.6. Yeah, the efficacy goes from 92 to 95. So three right. bonus percentage That's points. Right. Think of the buoyancy, the extra buoyancy in the ocean of two life preservers. <laughs> I mean, come yeah. on, come yeah. on, Marty. Okay. Get your head on right. First of all, and I got to say this, by saying these anti-dogma kind of things, although other, even Osterholm was saying it at Osterholm, that time, Ashish right? Ashish Jha, Bob Walker, lots, Ashish Jha, lots Walker, of Walker, yeah, first dosers, right? Yeah. You guys are the first dose clan. Oh, the clan is a very triggering word. You guys are the first dose crew. <laughs> Trigger word. With right, a K, group, right. right. <laughs> um, you, many people will brand you as a heretic. I mean, it, it, you, you're, not, you're not just a, a dissenting scientific opinion. You are a bad human being. That's how we tribalize this stuff during the pandemic, which is, is a huge problem. And then, okay. It gets, yeah, everyone wants to size you up. Are you one of us on uh, our side? Are you a liberal or are you one of them, a conservative? And you know, that that's not healthy, especially and, right now. And the reality is I'm not partisan, I'm independent. Like you and I, okay, you are the most all middle person I know. Like in the <laughs> beginning, you were taking stances that were pissing off the right. Wait, universal masking? Yeah. Wait, this thing is not the flu? Yeah. Wait, what? Yeah. I'm going on Fox and saying that. Yeah, I went on Fox <laughs> Sunday morning show in March said hundreds of thousands of Americans will die from this. Yeah. And I'm sure like Brit Hume and these guys were like, wait, what? I'm sorry, Marty, you mean uh, hundreds of thousands of foreigners will die, not us, right? Can you repeat that? <laughs> he, he he was a little taken, actually he was taken back was by he? my comments, <laughs> but he came around actually. But then but then, just to prove that you're not some kind of left-wing stooge, then you say things like, <laughs> um, for example, <laughs> just now, hey, we're gonna have herd immunity by the end of April. And by the way, this pandemic's gonna be over because the vaccines are great. And by the way, natural immunity is a thing. And guess what? You were pretty much right about everything because cases have plummeted. Natural immunity does contribute. And the, and the, probably the left was like, oh, who is this fascist going on, <laughs> you know, Fox News saying that this thing's over? Well, it's amazing. Ignoring natural immunity, which oddly our public health officials have done, and I think it's more a function of the old school nature of, of, of those officials, right? We, we don't have data on natural immunity, you know? It's like, open your eyes. No one is getting reinfected at any appreciable degree. It, with severity, with severity. Yeah, and yeah. when the reinfections occur, the Danish study, less than six tenths of 1% of, the, of people got reinfected. They, they're mild when they happen. And the idea that, you know, oh, reinfection could happen. It's been around 15 months, the virus. Where are those reinfections? Yeah. Where's the the death and disability from reinfections? We right. don't, we, it's like Bigfoot, right? Right. But but variants, Marty, but variants. Yeah. So the variants, uh, we've had hundreds of variants. None of them have evaded the life-saving protection of the vaccines, Bingo. none of them. Including a recent study of an, uh, in the Indian variant and Pfizer That's and right. AstraZeneca, both 
highly effective. Absolutely, exactly, yeah. yeah. And the Indian variant's the ones that everybody's wetting their pants about because India's doing so poorly, even though the Indian variant isn't driving a lot of that poor uh, outcome. It's actually the UK variant initially. So why why are our public health officials dangling variant fear so much at a time when honestly people need hope? <laughs> they, need, uh, they not only need hope is accurate. It's not like we're yeah, like I mean, slinging a lie, you right, know. It's right. like you know what? <laughs> right. Hope, hope sells. The price we pay. Why medical <laughs> care in the U.S. is garbage? No, it, it's true. Uh, um, Rochelle Walensky. Yes. <laughs> um, Hallowed be her name. Um, I admire her. I just wish she would speak what I believe she knows to be true sometimes, right? Mm. S- kids at summer camp have to be six feet apart with a mask outdoors. She knows better, mm. okay? She's a smart doctor. She mm. was at Hopkins, well-respected, mm. head of ID at uh, Harvard, MGH. Or, yeah, She knows better. She can't go against the party line, right? Mm-hmm. There's, a, there's party line stuff. There's stuff that the CDC career staff puts out, and she's afraid of speaking her mind. I thought we were supposed to be listening to science right now. No, 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 no. We're listening to the science, Marty. The science science is whatever my tribe says the science is. It's dogma. It's not a scientific process. So for example, National Nurses United or whatever, the big nursing union came out and they were like, "Um, you know, all this time they've been shouting about follow the science, stay home, mask up, which all fine. Now they're like, well, we disagree with the CDC. We think masks need to continue. Why? Well, because science. Wait, where? You don't think the CDC looked at science to right. make their decision? Now right. that now that they're saying something you disagree with, it's suddenly not science anymore. <laughs> What's the name of that group again? The National National Nurse- Nurses United, I think. Nurses United. Yes. The most disunited, ununited group <laughs> in terms of their support of that union. I mean, oh, that, that, yeah, it's a union. Yeah, it's a yeah, union. Yeah, so yeah. the names are deceiving, right? Right, right, So right, the right. unions in general- want this pandemic to go forever. Okay, yeah. I'm just gonna put that out yeah, there. Yeah, uh, teachers unions? Oh yeah, teachers yeah. unions, I mean, that was a joke. That was yeah, a, yeah. That it's, was it's, a, it's, it's, it's criminal. We yeah. abandoned yeah. America's kids. Children, Because yeah. they don't vote and they don't have a voice. Ooh. And, and it's San Francisco, right here in San Francisco. Today, okay, we've got one-tenth the numbers of a seasonal flu right now in terms of daily new cases and in terms of the case fatality rate is now the same. Yeah. It was, in the past, comparisons to flu were atrocious because it was far more dangerous, COVID far more dangerous than the flu. I made those arguments to people all the time mm-hmm. last year. This is not the flu. I mean, that's that's one of the reasons so many people hated me last year. Mm. This is not the flu. And now the case fatality rate has changed. Mm-hmm. The case fatality rate has decreased because it is now in younger, younger people, people mm-hmm. healthier people, mm-hmm. and the case fatality rate now is similar to flu. Uh, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I wrote a piece uh, on the, in the New York Post on this. And in terms of daily case numbers, we're at about uh, 18,000. Okay, yeah. about 18,000 yesterday. Now, that, some of that was weekend reporting. Actually, 12,000 is last I saw from Stat News. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I That's saw ridiculously that low, yeah. Yeah, so weekend report. But, you know, we're in this ballpark right yeah. now. So, um Guess how many daily new flu cases we have in the middle of a mild flu season? The most mild flu season of the last eight years was 2015, 2016. Right. That was the most mild flu season. In the middle of that flu season, guess how many daily flu cases we had? It must have been in the thousands. 450,000, almost half a million. Per day? Per day. In a slow flu season? In the mildest flu season in the last eight years. We are one-tenth that number of daily cases Mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. We've got... In-person learning only two days a week in San Francisco schools. San yeah, Francisco right. had 12 cases in the whole city on yeah, Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. We've got yeah. only kids that are two days a week right now, today. And where are our public health officials speaking up on, on behalf of those kids? They're it's scared. a disgrace. They're scared of the unions. They're scared of the unions. They're scared of their own teachers in their own schools. Listen, I was asked to speak at my own school district as an expert, mm-hmm. expert mm-hmm. on COVID. They need you. Well, this is the problem. If I do that, I was worried that my own children would be retributed against because one of their teachers w- is like the biggest advocate for keeping school o- offline. They're militant. It's terrifying. And my own daughter was like, please don't do this. Please don't do this, daddy. Like, and I said, well, okay, well, I know who is doing it and they're gonna advocate. So that, that's what's happened. When even I'm afraid for my own kids, like if it was me, I'd be like, 
Yeah, let me add them. You guys are, are you have, are you kidding me? Yeah. Like, uh, and, and uh, but, but it's really, and you know, Vinay Prasad's been pushing it, you know. Mm-hmm. It, it, a lot it, of people. It's, it's, it, it, and the thing is, doctors are afraid to stand up and say these things. This is where we need to stand up as professionals. Our communities need us right now when we see this. Medicine has an incredible heritage of being a voice for the voiceless. Mm. You look at our our ancestors in medicine, you look at our incredible track record, look at the care of, of kids with polio in 1954. When that vaccine was created, Salk said he would give it as a gift to the world. He would never get a patent so as many kids in the world can get it as possible. That is our great heritage. Mm-hmm. And now we sort of don't want to say anything because we're, you know, this is an American disgrace right now. So I don't think the unions represent their members, uh, despite yeah. their name. I think you're right. And honestly, that, that's kind of why you wrote this book too, because here here we are complicit in these financial crimes against our patients, surprise billing, out of network charges, air ambulance fees, non-transparent pricing, uh, people going bankrupt, hospital systems suing their own Patience, Gosh, yeah. and the doctors don't even know. Complacent, like, complacent. I mean, if they know they to keep morally integritous, that's not a word. I, they they have to they have to deny they even know about it. As soon as we tell the doctors, hey, this is what your hospital is doing. We discovered these cases. Guess what? Yeah, they're outraged. Yeah. They they think it should stop. I mean, yeah. they are they are, there's a social justice mission to medicine. Look, look, I want to show these guys this. So, if you guys think advocacy doesn't make a difference. If you think physicians speaking up doesn't make a difference, it makes a difference. And this is why Marty writes this book a few years back. Well, how yeah, when was it? A year and a half ago. Year and a half ago. You came on the show, we did a thing. Mm-hmm. I was passionate after reading it. Was I was pissed off. I dropped so many F bombs in that episode <laughs> that it made it unshareable. And I, I heard apologize a lot about for that. It. Yeah, yeah. All my friends told me. Oh gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Cause you you didn't even watch it. You're like too many F bombs. <laughs> and and um the book comes out. Now you're you have the paperback edition that came out with a, a revised afterword summing up COVID and other things. And this graph says it all. This, guys, is the number of lawsuits against patients pre-book. That's this area. The book comes out and look what happened to the number of lawsuits against patients for not paying their bills. It plummets. What's the inflection point? a physician and a team of physicians and a group of people speaking out and saying, this is an outrage, this is against our calling, this is creating moral injury in us, how can we allow it to happen? It works! Thank you, Marty. Our students, nurses, uh, around the country, we told people, go talk to your medical facility and ask them these basic questions. How do they do on medical billing quality? (laughs) Financial toxicity is a medical complication. Yeah. Billing, uh, medical quality is, encompasses billing quality. Billing quality is medical quality. So look, we shut it down. We shut it down in about 70% of the places where it was happening that we studied it. So the Mm. book um, has a follow-up on each section. Mm. But this is the the sort of millennial social, social justice generational value that came out in my students to say, hey, we we don't want to tolerate this. We want to go and shut this down. Mm. We called CEOs and asked them, will you please stop suing patients? Mm. Well, what are you call- who are you calling for? What, what is this? Is this? Are you calling for them from the media? No, we're just asking you to stop. <laughs> are, is this on the record? No, we're just asking you to stop. Your hospital sued 25,000 people and in their town. Of they're 30. not rich patients. No, they're no. The Walmart workers. Yeah food service workers. Who had no say in what the bill was gonna be because there's no disclosure of what the prices are. Yeah, we, That's the thing. We, we published a paper in JAMA on the practice of hospitals suing patients. Most hospitals won't do it. A third did. And so good stuff is happening. I good love stuff it, is I love happening. it. So this, this kind of, it's not, I, I don't even like the term activism. This is just speaking up for what's right when you know what's right and you're in the industry. And now, so so speaking of that, like, so you've, again, you've been pretty right on a lot of things on the pandemic. Um, I have to say this, we're, it seems to me like we are in a phase now where this pandemic is finishing in the United States because of vaccines and all the other things. And I know this for a fact, you know why? Because I went to a memorial service in Berkeley, Berkeley, one the bastion of liberal doom upon earth. So if you're talking, <laughs> I went there for an undergrad and it actually made me more conservative because I was like, 
these people are crazy, okay. but yet I love them. Mm -hmm. You know, like all people are, are just, they're just, they're, they're expressing what their moral palette is in the world, right? Yeah, yeah. And as long as they leave me alone, I'm fine with it. <laughs> so I go back to Berkeley because a, a, a real important mentor in my life had passed during the pandemic and they were just catching up having the memorial. And I went to this party because they made it a party for, for this guy who was just, again, I wouldn't be who I am if it wasn't for this guy really believing in me and saying, you know what, you can be a teacher and you can do this even though you feel like you can't. And um, I met his family and all his friends and there were dozens, dozens, if not hundreds of people at this thing, indoor and outdoor. No one was wearing a mask. Everyone was vaccinated. People were hugging and shaking hands. These are strangers to Good. each other. Good. It was so beautiful. Good. And if that's happening in a place whose tribal identity, if you're a liberal, is to believe that this pandemic is never gonna end, I don't think it's true. I think these guys were showing the truth, which is the pandemic is over and it's because of actual rational science and, and the like. So that's it. We've got to reestablish a human connection again. Look at the power of the human touch that we see as physicians at the bedside. It's, it's monumental, right? When you're <clears throat> in that bed with abdominal pain in the emergency room, we put a hand on your shoulder and say, we're going to take good care of you. It, it makes the biggest difference in the world that society needs that right now. Loneliness was an epidemic before COVID and it's been magnified. We've got to start rebuilding communities. And look, it's not er COVID is not eradicated. We're not going to get to some, it's going to circulate at levels of five to 10,000 cases a day probably for a year or two until we stop testing like crazy. Mm. Um, you know, the PCR test will detect 10 molecules of viral particles. <laughs> Come on, yeah. Right? So, I mean, anyway, of course people who've been vaccinated are gonna test positive. Sure. Here's how a vaccine works. The, the virus comes in, it starts replicating, the, the immune system revs up. In the time it's replicating, you're gonna test positive. <laughs> right, there's gonna be some remnant particles <laughs> right. there. It's not like, you're not a leper, you know? It's like, <laughs> and then, so I think we're gonna hit this equilibrium, but yeah. You know, I, we used to talk about herd immunity. And mm -hmm. when I wrote the piece in the winter saying that herd immunity will come in late spring and we'll, we'll have a wonderful summer, mm. um, the term quickly got politicized. Yeah, I, I learned. Yeah, it did. Yeah, it did. In part because there was the largest spending bill ever in the history of the United States on the floor oh. of the Senate days before, days a, um, uh, during the, uh, the article came out. So oh. for that week until the vote, all of a sudden, it's like, hey, we're going to pass $3 trillion, largest spending bill ever for long term for COVID. And some schmuck there at Johns Hopkins is saying, saying, it's over. Hey, we're going to mostly be done with this thing in a couple months. <laughs> I didn't realize that. Of course, that makes sense. That's how it got so politicized. Yeah. Members of Congress told me that. Oh, is Members that right? Members of Congress told me that. Yeah. Because you're based in DC. So, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know what was happening on wow. the floor. But, um, you know, the point was that we've been. Heaven a forbid the wait. Heaven forbid that you just are thinking about the science of it. Yeah, I mean, I was doing a lot what of- What votes going on and what's that, doesn't matter. There, There's probably a lot of infectious diseases doctors out there that might be watching this and said, you know, I remember he called me just before that article to talk about natural immunity. Cause I, you know, I'm a public policy guy, do public health research. I took epidemiology at the, at the School of Public Health, but my focus has been sort of the redesign of healthcare. Right. And research methods, policy. I've done a lot of research. so. And you're a surgeon, which means you know nothing. <laughs> so it means I'm a plumber. <laughs> so um, I talked to these docs and basically was was like, don't we have a lot of data on natural immunity? It's powerful. And they were like, yeah. And we here's the estimates. It was a you know crapshoot what the prevalence was. Uh. Turns out the California zero prevalence studies confirmed it's a, it was about half the population of Los Angeles back in March. Yeah, a lot of cases since then. Yeah, and those who have circulating antibodies is not even the full story. It's also those with activated T cells, yeah. which, so you can be antibody negative. Yeah. So anyway, there's a lot of it. There's a lot of it. So now yeah. today, 62% of the adult population has been vaccinated. Mm. Roughly half of those who have not been have natural immunity. That means today, 80 to 85% of adults in America have immunity. <laughs> Makes it harder for the virus to jump around in a community. What do you call that? Um, uh, e dynamic equilibrium. I will not say herd immunity, Marty, because yeah. that will violate 
my badge of tribal identity. Well, you may remember New York Times had a little article where, where they just interviewed four people, one of whom is an expert in evolution. Mm. And they declared that there will never be herd immunity. I saw that. And it's like herd immunity is not binary. Yeah. It's gradual slowing. It's like me, non-binary. Okay, my pronouns <laughs> are ZPAC slash supporter. <laughs> Sorry. My preferred pronoun is author of the price we pay <laughs> and supporter of the ZPAC. This is his pronouns right here. That's okay. My it's a, so, by the way, my daughter, uh, my daughter told me that um, she was wondering why kids were putting their pronouns all over their Zoom online. She's like nine. She's like, why are these kids putting like? I go, well, what are their names? Maybe they're ambiguous. She goes, Sally, Billy. I'm like, so what pronouns? And she goes, yeah, I'm going to make my pronouns she him. She I'm like, is that a thing? <laughs> you should do that. <laughs> all the above. All the above. Yeah, those. <laughs> How about, can we just have a default? Oh, I like that. Like- Like you're this until proven otherwise? Yeah, I mean, do we do we need, do you need to tell me that you're, he? I, I'm gonna get in big trouble here. Of course, sure, right? we both are, but. Yeah, but uh, can we just have a default? Like, do we need to take up that much time? I like the, def a... I like the default being this. <laughs> <laughs> well, this here says it has no pronouns. <laughs> here, here's my, here's an honest thought for, Eight seconds of seriousness. Yeah. Gender confusion is a normal part of child development. Mm -hmm. And if we immediately assign something to that when there's no biological, medical, or otherwise support for it, don't you think some people may be using that choice to maybe rebel against their parents, seek autonomy, independence? That's where I'm concerned because there are absolutely transgender people out there and they've been under-recognized, under-appreciated, under-misunderstood. We need to give them, you know, um, the independence and the dignity that they deserve. That's real. That there are there's, there's we're not we sh no one should be a denier. That, but when you open the door to people with normal gender confusion, hey, come on over to this side. You know, it's it's you know different. When it's normal confusion, I'm not sure that's healthy. That that's a really in, that's a beautiful insight actually because it almost lessens the struggle of actually people who really have profound, um, um, uh, I don't even I can't really find the right word for it is dysphoria or or they they're like no this is clear I am not this gender that was assigned at birth right? yeah. yeah and and it's interesting because I actually heard from somebody here there's a big private school in town where a lot of the kids are you know, kids of very affluent parents, like all the tech people and all that. And a quarter of this population in the school identifies as gender non-determinant. And it's kind of like, well, wow. Like, is that just like taking a cross section of that whole population? And they're just, there is the normal confusion. Like, well, I like to play with dolls, but I also like to shoot things or I like, you know, what is it? Or is it again, like a cultural thing? Like it's kind of cool to say, hey, I don't know, I'm, non-binary or whatever. And does that lessen the actual experience of, and I don't know, I don't know, but we can't even talk about it. Like both of us are kind of looking at each other like, is this even just bringing this up going to get us canceled? And are the we truth is, right now canceled on Facebook? Are people even listening to us right now? We haven't now even released we... it yet. And we're proactively canceled. Like, <laughs> Amazon Web Services. <laughs> has... AWS is picking it up and they're like, uh, I'm noticing gender talk and it's not dogma. I figure it's just me and you talking right now because we've been canceled. That's, we've been canceled. Yeah, in fact, right now we can just say what we really think. Okay, this is the thing. Yeah. I think Bob Dole should run again. What, Bob Dole's dead? I'm sorry, Never mind. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, we can say whatever. <laughs> it's, um, it, it, it is interesting. And, and actually, that is, let's, let's focus on kids for a second. So- this is another non-dogma thing that I would like to talk about. Kids 12 to 15 or, or younger, once that gets EUA'd, getting vaccinated. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I wrote a piece in the Washington Post basically making the case for child vaccination and made it in a way that people may not be familiar with. And that is, mm. it's not really going to save a kid's life. Right. The 230 deaths of from COVID in kids under age 18. That's a pretty broad definition of kids, by the way, since kids 12 to 15 are physiologically similar to a 16, 17-year-old. Right. 
<laughs> and you know, younger kids. I, I believe children are just little adults. That's what my pediatrics rotation tells <laughs> me. Yeah, they love me. that. Oh, they, they love, love that. that. Yeah. <laughs> well, somebody's going to be knocking on this door pretty soon. So. An angry pediatrician with a stethoscope with a couple bunnies on it. Yeah. Ready to just clock you in the oh, face. Oh, if you yeah. want to get a pediatrician fired up, just say, I know you have a code and we don't have a pediatric code kit, but would this adult kit work? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but in pedi- the beautiful thing about pediatrics in all seriousness, that it, in field is intrinsically a voice for the voiceless, which yeah. is the cool thing, right? And yeah. that's why they spoke up about schools needing to be in person exactly, early. Exactly, right? exactly. Yeah. They took a very collective stance on that. Yeah, yeah they, they did great. So, yeah. um, But so it, it's not really to prevent death. So the, de- the 230 deaths uh, in kids under age 18 to date have all been in kids that have a chronic condition or pre-existing condition to the best of our knowledge. In other words, there's never been a documented case of an entirely healthy kid dying of COVID. Now, is, that, sure, is that right? That's right. That. Now, yeah. we, we did an analysis um, with Fair Health, and it turns out that in looking at half of the nation's health insurance data, there was not a single healthy kid wow. who died. Wow. Now, I'm sure it's out there. I'm sure it's happened. Right, right. You know, right. Um, but- so if they have a chronic condition, for sure get the vaccine right. once they can. That makes sense. Yeah. Let's say they're healthy. People might appropriately say, hey, the risk of death is infinitesimally small. Mm-hmm. Do I really need to do this? Right. Legitimate question. Right. It's not necessarily to save their life with the vaccine. It is to prevent the inflammatory syndrome, the, the MISC. MISC. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, we found about 10,000 cases. Well, that is, we extrapolate about 10,000 cases based on the reported cases. Oh, okay. We think there's been about 10,000 cases of, of, that MISC. Infl- of MISC okay. in the United States during COVID. And that, and you know, as Paul Offit says, if you could see it up front and personal in the ICU, it's, it's brutal, it's painful. Right. And it can have sequela. Right. So it's also to prevent that. Right. And that, and that makes a lot of sense. I guess one of the questions I would have is like, do we know in that population at scale, is there adverse um, events like a myocarditis or something that we, we don't think is vaccine induced, but that could emerge that then would say, okay, tip the risk benefit balance. Now, and I have to say this, I did a video on this, but I, and I also said, okay, this is why I'm vaccinating my child. And, and my reasons were, I don't want her being out of school for two weeks with COVID. I don't think I don't think her chance of MISC are very high. I don't think her chance of transmitting are very high. But I want to be able to travel confidently without having to be quarantined. Like very practical things. And my daughter wanted it, so we got we publicly vaccinated her using a video and everything, and and uh, she enjoyed it. She had a comment during it. She said she was wearing her mask, and we were at Kaiser getting it done, and because um, they had this nice outdoor thing, and she's wearing the mask. And I go, "How do you? What do you know? What are you doing?" She goes, "Well, uh, I like this mask." Because it covers my acne while causing it. <laughs> so a real chip off the old block that child. Anyway, so you were going to say something. Um, yeah, no, so I think it, it makes sense for uh, parents to get their kids vaccinated to prevent that MISC. Right. But we've got in this country to start respecting those who choose not to get the vaccine. Hello, thank you. And I never thought I'd say that. We need we need to stop shaming them. We yeah. need to if we want to address vaccine hesitancy, mm-hmm. it's very simple. We don't need a celebrity running a commercial. Bingo. Or some senator from Mississippi singing a song. Okay. That happened? That happened. Oh senator my gosh. Kennedy. I, I'm not against them doing that. <laughs> needles, 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 go and get your needles. Like what 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 was it? It was even it was even Cornier worse than that? singing quality Ooh. than than that. And you're, you're I'm a trained you know, professional. You're a professional. <laughs> Look, they're welcome to do that, right? They're all God's children. <laughs> but that's not going to do it, okay? That's not getting politicians up there to do commercial. Here's what you do. It's pretty simple. Stop shaming people. Yeah. Respect their decision. Have easy walk-in clinics where it's just accessible in the normal points of routine life. Bingo. That's how you increase yep. vaccine yep. adoption. Okay, flip the clinics so they don't have to register online. Yep. You can walk out after you get your groceries bagged yep. and stop by and somebody says, hey, do you have five minutes to get your COVID vaccine? Perfect. Perfect. That's how you do it. That's, make it easy, cheap, convenient. Absolutely right. Yeah. And and you know, honestly, I, I gotta give a shout out to Kaiser. They made it quite easy. And we're not even Kaiser patients. Um, we're like free agents. Mm-hmm. And uh, in other words, our children see no one because- they have two physician parents who can mistreat their pediatric conditions. <laughs> that's, on, no, that's not true. But but uh, yeah, and 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 I think it, the the other, I think interesting thing there is um, 
getting them back connected with a primary doc or a pediatrician as an excuse to go get the vaccine means they can catch up with all the childhood vaccines they didn't get during the pandemic. So that's another benefit of vaccination for kids. Now, what, what this myocarditis thing is interesting. I think it's still early and it probably may not be in association with vaccine, but even if it is, I think the number of cases are quite small and you could still make a risk benefit argument and say, well, okay, you, you now the parents have this information. So let's make a decision. Kind of like with Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Do you think the pause of Johnson and Johnson was just the worst decision in the history of mankind? Or what do you think? I think it was an average poor decision for the FDA. <laughs> So just average on the spectrum. Right? I'll tell you what the worst decision was the FDA made. So there's about half a dose in the vial after you aspirate the vaccine and let's say the Pfizer vial. Yeah. There's about half a dose. Uh -huh. Doctors and nurses wanted to aspirate that half dose and aspirate another half dose from another vial. Combine them. And you would increase the vaccine supply by 15% mm. if you did that. Mm. The FDA had a warning official label, you cannot, you're not allowed to do that. Whoa. So these big vaccine centers, do you think they're gonna break the FDA rule? No, they no, can't, they can't, right? Yeah. It's a policy. Uh, Inova Fairfax Hospital, including their CEO, made a very, very clear plea to the FDA. People are dying thousands a day. We know how to aspirate things with sterile technique. We're not using the same needle on 50 people. Right. We're not idiots. And that's why the FDA didn't allow it. Like, oh, it could be contamination. Oh. You're aspirating three different, four different doses from the same vial. Anyway, you're not using the same needle. Yeah. You're aspirating with a sterile needle. You're injecting, you're disposing of the needle and you get another needle. FDA said no. Multiple times they, they people were asking them. Mm. And you just want to be like, are you completely disconnected from reality? From reality. Yeah. We would have increased our vaccine supply by 15% if you would have just let that. I know it threw out, threw out thousands of doses mm. in December and, and tens of thousands when people of doses. People were, were desperate. Yeah. And people were dying and people were desperate. And look, this is the thing. We, all of that would have been fine and dandy. We would have looked back and gone, oh, who cares if the vaccines weren't the most effective freaking thing. When yeah. we look at just a <laughs> Israel, yeah. you know? And then they look at the Seychelles, this little islands in India. Have you heard about this thing? Yeah. So, so you know, 60% vaccine penetrance and now they're getting like a, a surge, including some vaccinated people and plus or minus tourists and stuff. And it's like, well, did you see what vaccines they used? They use the Chinese vaccine, which in the best of circumstances is like 40% efficacious. And then like the B-list version of AstraZeneca, I actually don't know if that's true, but it was like AstraZeneca light. <laughs> <laughs> a quarter dose of Sputnik. <laughs> you throw a little Sputnik in just, it's like, you know, in Russia, all vaccine trials are placebo versus placebo. <laughs> Now, is the FDA going to come after me? Oh, is this fortified in here? Well, let's just say Amazon Web Services already blocked us for the pronoun thing, so <laughs> I think we're we're probably good. <laughs> if uh, if I don't show up one day to uh, to work, I want you to know all my passwords are Z Dog number one. <laughs> you know what? That used to be my password. <laughs> like 10 years ago, nice. before I was like famous, I was like, ZDog1, who's ever gonna put that in, <laughs> right? You know what's crazy is when you first um, came on my show about this book, I I said in all dead seriousness, I said, do you have bodyguards? Like, cause major, major institutions, legacy players are threatened by this because they make money on the backs of suing poor patients for overinflated charges that they've been playing money games, fighting insurance companies over time and jacking up prices. And guess who pays the rack rate? The uninsured person. It's sick, dude. Yeah, they're yeah. losing. The medical establishment is is losing big time right now to a group of forward thinking docs and nurses and young students who are saying, we wanna redesign healthcare, this system is broken. If somebody comes in, and we tell them exercise more, eat better, and then come back in six weeks after you take this medicine every day. And they are non-compliant. They come back, and we tell them you bad, bad non-compliant. Yeah. Pa yeah. Do patients hate that. Yeah. Doctors hate it. Yeah. Nurses hate. It. Why are we doing it? Yeah. It's broken. It's done. It's, it's done. done. And so we're seeing a revolution right now, redesigning healthcare, and that's the exciting thing. I, ca I can't wait. And you know, one thing I got to say this, so like, you know, I've had uh, Robbie Pearl on the show. I've mm -hmm. had you on the show. Both of you guys put some provocative things out there about like physician behavior and not just specifically physician behavior, but systemic issues that happen to involve physician behavior or physician culture, et cetera. Now, this is what I found. 
this triggers doctors in a way that they behave exactly as you would predict they would behave based on what you say in the books. So <laughs> Robbie's like, well, there's gonna be anger and denial and repression, and they do all of that because they don't see, they don't see that two things can be simultaneously true. They cannot hold any degree of paradox that the system is fundamentally broken, that it's designed to basically not help us, but actually causes us harm as physicians, let's say. Forget about patients, that already assumed it's causing them harm. It's causing us harm. But then that is also true that our own culture of like resisting change, not working in teams, wanting entirely 100% autonomy without obeying any guidelines that are shown by evidence to actually help, unexplained care variation, um, ridiculous billing practices, fee for service, this kind of thing. Those can simultaneously be true while still physicians being good people and we can work on yeah. all of them at once. What I found <clears throat> in doing the research for that book is that doctors want to get beyond the walls of their hospitals and deal with the underlying issues that bring people to care, mm. but they don't have any guidance or a path to do that. It, there's no specialty for how do you- <laughs> Social determinants of health. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we throw out these buzzwords right. and everybody feels good and we right. go to these conferences and these panels at the Ritz-Carlton. Uh, we need to address social determinants of health. <laughs> yeah, oh my gosh, yes. Atul Gawande and uh, Eric Topol will be on a panel today <laughs> talking about the social determinants of health with Z-Dog MD moderating. It's right. like, that's gonna push the needle. It's really oh, gonna push yeah, the needle. that's gonna yeah. make a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but um, what I found is there's, a group of enlightened disruptors who are partnered often with entrepreneurs who are saying, can we start talking about school lunch programs instead mm. of just talking about bariatric surgery? Mm. Can we talk about food as medicine? Can we talk about educating folks and spending time with them and addressing sleep when we see that their blood pressure is high instead of just throwing meds at them? Mm. Can we deal with diabetes by talking about cooking classes instead of just throwing insulin at people? These students message me all the time. These young doctors message me all the time. They're saying exactly that. I just had a, uh, a this is a fascinating- It gets them excited. It, oh, they get so fired up. Yeah. I had an Australian emergency physician send me a video directed at me. Just to hear, I gotta say this to you, z Dog. I came from Australia. Americans are amazing. American physicians are amazing. Why is it that we torture people until they die? Why is it that we do so many unnecessary tests? Mm -hmm. Why is it that physicians no longer have a contact point with their patients where they're doing an act of service directly for patients, like drawing their blood or putting in an IV or holding their hands? We don't do that. We've outsourced that to everybody else. So all these really interesting observations. She's yeah. like, this is all I care about, Z-Dog. Can you talk about this? And I'm like, yeah. I was like, woman, I've been screaming about this for 10 years. <laughs> Come on, join me. This is a thing. It's and, true. And when you're in med school or trying to figure a career path out, people are hungry for this stuff, mm. but they're told anesthesiology, if you like this, mm. um, psychiatry, if you like this, internal medicine, if you like that, you know what? Maybe they're, they are also interested in addressing the underlying things that bring people to the mm. hospital, mm. addressing the way we deliver healthcare, redesigning healthcare, looking holistically Mm. Uh, addressing the environmental exposures that cause cancer instead of just learning the chemo protocols. Yep. People are hungry for this stuff and we're starting to see healthcare get redesigned. Real systems thinkers. Yeah. Real systems thinkers. Systems thinkers. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. A, it's 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 you know I talk about alt middle a lot this idea <laughs> is this, this this perch of like being able to critically think, see a little truth and partiality, notice that the human systems are complex systems, humans are complex, assume good intent, etc. The, the the technological equivalent of that is systems thinking. Mm -hmm. It's saying, oh, this is a web of interconnected stuff. Everything is is whole and part of a whole in itself. Mm -hmm. uh, Ken Wilber calls this the holon. We're all holons, right? Mm -hmm. H-O-L-O-N. So we're all true, but part of something truer. And so if a medical student wants to go into that field of study, don't we need that now? Like we should be celebrating that. We should forgive their loans for doing it, you know? And what do we call it, right? Because if oh, it, yeah. it, preventive medicine does not capture no, it. No, I no, just no, feel no. like learning when women have to start mammograms is not no. what we're talking about. No, when I hear preventative medicine, I just think, oh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I don't speak broke. <laughs> like, <laughs> like it's been so stigmatized, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's, but you capture it, I think, a little bit with healthcare 3.0. Mm -hmm. um, I talk about the redesign of yep. healthcare. Holistic medicine has sort of different meanings to different thing people. 
No, it sounds alternative y and it's not right. It alienates some people. Right. 3.0 3. is, it's all, they all point at the same thing. They're saying a systems minded, rehumanized, Oh, and you know what? You add rehumanized. a different- Rehumanized. Rehumanized. Yeah, so what it is, you think about systems which allows you to rehumanize the care, which we've suck, sucked out in the second iteration, 2.0. 2.0 had good intent. It said, oh, there are these processes yeah. that are really good. Yeah. Like, oh, there's these, you know, NCQA and, and- Epic and will save us. Epic will save yeah, us. Yeah, it if, did that. If we just have- Yeah, it worked, right? It worked. <laughs> it worked it saved Judy, uh, Judy Faulkner's wallet, that's for sure. <laughs> it drove a quarter of- Doctors into you know burnout, burnout, yeah. you know, and and literally drove some into non life because <laughs> people just are like, no, I can't take it, right. and and the truth is like, look, all of that is necessary but insufficient to build 3.0. You need 2.0 optimized before 3.0 happens. But if you think 2.0 is the end, like, and that's what a lot of people think. They're like, mm. well, if we just buff this assembly line and get our Toyota lean processes down to an art, it'll work. And then you forget that everyone feels like a commodity. The patients feel like commodities. You've sucked the human component out of it. No. So 3.0 takes one, which was that old paternalistic thing, you know, where it was like doctor patient, full autonomy, paternalism. Mm. A lot of beauty there, though, because mm -hmm. I knew you, you know me as yeah. patient and doctor. And you relationship. Know, you had a relationship. So take the best aspects of that and integrate the shadow part. Well, the shadow part was we overbuild. Uh, it was fee for service, it was super paternalistic. You know, it Middle was a bunch man. of white men. What's that? And middlemen. Middlemen everywhere, middlemen yeah. everywhere yeah. that were making money. Then 2.0, well, what's good about 2.0? Yeah, we probably need an electronic health record that doesn't suck. That's a good idea. <laughs> like, I don't, I haven't going back to paper is the right idea. Like, when was that a good idea? You know what would be great is being able to write on paper because there is a physical and thought cognitive connection with writing and have it translated instantly into yeah. a beautiful note. Imagine that, lock it in a, in a, in a cabinet and it's cyber secure. <gasps> oh my gosh. What? Like who can hack a cabinet? <laughs> I, I dare the Russians to do that. It's amazing. Yeah. So take those best aspects of 2.0, but get rid of uh, like integrate that shadow of um, depersonalization and commodification. 3.0 then it emerges something that's bigger than the sum of its parts. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. It's a new emergent. Mm -hmm. And it thinks in an integral way. It says yes and to all these little bits. And it says, yeah, oh, the guidelines work great, except for this patient. Well, this is an exception. And I have the tools, resources, and autonomy to honor that exception instead of being penalized. Remember when they were saying, oh, you gotta treat a uh, pneumonia within six hours or you're gonna get dinged, right? Hedis yeah, or whatever, yeah. yeah. And it's like, yeah, that works great until you start giving unnecessary antibiotics because you're treating a pneumonia you haven't been able to diagnose yet because you haven't been able to get a history from the family because the, the data doesn't line up and the patient's nonverbal and- Yeah, you know. and by the way, antimicrobial resistance is the next great world pandemic that will uh, totally. <laughs> projected to kill 10 million people a year by 2050. But you know what, just go ahead and give antibiotics as liberally as you can. Go for it. I mean, meet the heatest measures. Totally. And we even forget, uh, forget about fungus. I mean, think about fungi, like mucor going crazy in India right now, right? Like uh -huh. think about like, you know, amphotericin resistant fungi, like how, yeah. how crappy that's gonna be. Yeah. Right? So, but no, continue to just Z pack for the, you know, worried well, you know, here it's you go. It's all about the Z pack. It is. I'm trying to get Pfizer to sue me by calling my tribe the Z pack. I'm like, come at me, Pfizer. Uh, five minutes later, there's a guy with a summons. <laughs> oh, I would love to tweet about that. Wouldn't that be great? That'd be so awesome. I think people will come to my defense. If Pfizer sues Z dog. Z dog for his Z pack. I would love oh, <laughs> trademark <man>. infringement. <laughs> Right. Well, you know, Z Pack, I think we should not give so many Z Packs. Is that, did I tell you I wanted to do a parody of um, Shaggy's It Wasn't Me? Do you know that song? Yeah. It Wasn't Me. Yeah. Shorty came in and she caught me red handed. I wanted to do about unnecessary uh, antibiotics called I Gave a Z. You know, Shorty came in and she coughing and wheezing, asking for the antibiotics. You know, oh, how I could it. I forget that she had C. diff last time around? You know, and you go through this whole thing and then Shaggy comes out. If you want your press candy to rock the score, <laughs> you give a little Z pack, then you give some more, you know, and he does the whole thing. But I never got around to it. I mean, that, isn't that the story of opioids? It's like, it wait, did we learn our lesson or not? It is, I mean, we that, did not. That was one medication that we were overusing. There are thousands oh my God. of them oh my out God. there, right? It's oh like, so, uh, you know, some, maybe something we can talk about later is our work on appropriateness of care. Yeah. Again, there's no specialty for this, but we've got the luxury of, of doing whatever we want in our research team, which is why we can respond quickly to COVID and opioids. Nice. And said, appropriateness of care, I think, is the big frontier. Mm. If patient safety was the wave of the last 15 years, appropriateness of care mm. is going to be that magical topic that we talk about. Uh, 
I'm with you on this, Marty. Let's make that our post pandemic, like blood brother, like pack, nice. because I am passionate about that. I think like what 30% minimum of what we do is BS doesn't help. And with good harm. intentions, with good intentions, as good I did intention. with opioids. Exactly. Right. I, I was giving them out like, candy. oh, hell yeah. I was like, you got hurt. You got hurt. You got hurt. Foo, 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 foo. The yeah. only thing that helps you starts with a D dog. And we were taught that too. Like, oh, well, if they have real pain, they're not going to get addicted. That's what far I told my residents don't, I don't write for 20. I write for 40. Bingo. That way they don't call you. They don't call you. Exactly. And I had no idea. Nope. I feel terrible. I kind of wrote a confessional a little bit in that Did you? In, the, in the book, The Price We Pay at the oh, End. Oh, yeah, yeah. I saw that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I think it's good for all of us to show humility around things that we get wrong. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm very open about the fact that, uh, you know, I heard a lot of people with good intentions good intention, yeah. uh, and maybe arguably bad science. So we can play a blame game and blame the Sackler family and, you know, the uh, Purdue Pharma. But the reality is, we probably had a responsibility to understand the addictive nature of it. Mm -hmm. Didn't really have a lot of follow-up after that first or second post-operative visit. Mm. A lot of us as surgeons pro probably missed uh, the degree by which some folks were being addicted to opioids. Mm -hmm. So anyway, there's an example of practice variation that we can measure now. Mm -hmm. And it's not, a same, it's not the same cap for everybody. Right. right, an ingrown toenail is does not hurt the same amount as an open thoracotomy. <laughs> but yet the insurance companies- and Depends the, on the patient. It depends if they're an the Indian patient. male, it hurts more. <laughs> There's something about Indian men. I know this as an Indian man, they're just like, oh, it's like one hangnail. <laughs> How's your dad doing, by the way? He's doing well. You know, he's 81, he's fully vaccinated. Nice. I'm seeing him this weekend. Um, we're bringing the kids. My, you know, my 13 year old's vaccinated. The youngest has like been not been in physical school, and it's kind of like, um, it's just wonderful to see that uh, we're starting to be human again. Mm. You know, and some people around the country will say, "Well, we never stopped." You know, we never stopped. Nah. It's it's just it's all your. You got to make your own risk benefit analysis based mm. on good data. We stop shaming people one way or the other. And just let people be people, but we should educate and and give it our give our opinion. What would I do for my loved one? Well, I probably wouldn't see them in the COVID surge without a mask, you know, until we can get vaccinated. But if you don't wear a mask and you have a breakthrough infection without symptoms, which is <laughs> which is against the testing guidelines, I could have up to ten viral particles <laughs> in my nasi naris mucosa. And test positive on a PCR test without symptoms, you are endangering my PCR positivity. <laughs> you know what? I identify as PCR positive, so I need you. Oh, man. Just... You need to respect my imagined PCR positivity, all right? Because I am a case. I respect it. Thank you. I just don't believe in it. We are so kidding. We're, we're I mean, canceled. We are so kidding. By the so, way, oh, go ahead. It's not bad to be canceled. No, in fact, it's a badge of honor these days. It's kind of cool. Yeah, I like it. I, I really enjoyed being banned by Facebook. Oh yeah, you got Wall Street Journal article. They Loved banned it. you. They awesome. banned you. Yeah, bring but they it actually on. didn't know they put they no they put a disclaimer. Watch Z Dog MD's debunking video of Marty's. I'm <laughs> right. like, I did a debunking video of Marty. <laughs> <laughs> bring it on. Give yeah, me more. I love it, dude. Hey, you want to get us canceled because we just have a few minutes left? Yeah. You want to get canceled finally? Yeah, let's do it. The origins mm. of COVID. Mm -hmm. Everyone's talking now about the Wuhan lab. Mm -hmm. What could be happening? Was it a plot? Tonight on Inside Edition. I don't know if the Inside Edition is still a thing, but. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a couple uh, septuagenarians that still watch Inside Edition, actually, yeah. <laughs> They're both my parents. <laughs> both like my mom will call me, you know, I saw Maury on Inside Edition and he said that, uh, you know, this apparently was invented by the Chinese. <laughs> it's like, really? Well, my wife is Chinese, so are we gonna? I'm, I gotta have to get a divorce because she's complicit in a crime against humanity. You have marital fights over the origins of the coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is the thing they talk about anti-API violence, which is a real thing. But what they don't realize is when when Asian people attack other, like my wife, just will slap me right across the face. I'm like, does that categorize as a hate crime? Because I'm telling you, she's Chinese and she can pack a punch, dude. Oh yeah, I mean. I've heard legends of uh, a fight within the Z pack, actually, what we call Z on Z violence. <laughs> <laughs> whack on whack uh, violence. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that's healthy. You know, it's good. It's good. Controversy can be good if we have different ideas. Um, so, so, what do you think about the potential of a lab accident? Yeah. 
Yeah. That's what happened. I'm convinced. Oh. Look, I don't think it's a hypothesis anymore. The yeah. lab leak hypothesis. Yeah. It is now transitioned to be the default conclusion of what happened because there's enough circumstantial evidence that it all fits together. Mm. There has really been a, an extensive analysis of different species of animals around the world, and we really don't see COVID-19 in any of those species that could have been transmitters. Mm. There was a population of penguins where it showed up. Um, there was there were mink in Denmark. We j you didn't see it in the animals that are in any you know any of the areas where there were outbreaks. Except, except for the bats, right? Because bats bat had a coronavirus. Uh -huh. but not COVID-19. Really? They had a oh, coronavirus. Okay. So okay. the question is, first of all, why the hell are we characterizing coronaviruses from animals in a lab? There's a million viruses in the world. Right. Most are in the animal kingdom. Uh, maybe 1% have crossed over in humans. Mm. Why are we trying to characterize them in a laboratory when it can be respiratory and lab accidents are common? Anyone who's worked in a lab- Knows, it's a total, in fact, can I tell a quick story? Yeah. So remember I told you I, I did this, I went to this memorial and it was this old guy I used to work with at a, at a MCAT course and he ran this business and taught MCAT. He, his wife told me at the thing, she goes, you know, he, he would talk nonstop about how you contaminated the entire office with your damn fruit flies that you brought back from the lab. <laughs> so these la these fruit flies, I worked in a Drosophila lab. Drosophila. They would get up in my shirt and stuff and I'd go there <laughs> and they bred in like, because the people would leave out their yogurt and all this stuff and they would eat it. And, and <laughs> apparently the place was infested for 10 years with fruit flies because of me. That was a lab accident. They happen in every lab. Every lab. Anyone who's worked in a lab. I mean, a lot of folks listening have worked in a lab. Right. Who is running, first of all, experiments run overnight and into late hours of the night. That's just the nature of the- right the time, timing of the reagents and so forth. Right. Who is in there pouring things and, and doing uh, the procedures at 2 a.m.? Right. Is it the senior lab person with experience or is it the young kid who wants to go to medical school with good intentions and is undertrained? It's Gunnar McGunnarsson trying to get the, uh, <laughs> trying to get the letter of rec. And he's like, what does this do? Anyway, <laughs> Gunner, I'm gonna go, is this bat? Or is this pangolon? <laughs> I don't know. Pangolon. Is that a civet cat? Ah, oh, let's just mix them up. Anyways, I gotta go. <laughs> I mean, that's probably, it's as plausible as anything. I was very resistant to this theory because I think it was being um, politicized by serious like Chinaphobes. Yeah, and that was also true. It was also yeah. being politicized yeah. by Chinaphobes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, but yeah. the Wall Street Journal is reporting from State Department intelligence that three, uh, three lab workers from Wuhan were reportedly treated at the Wuhan Central in Hospital November. in November. In November, and we've you know experts think it was October, and November when the first cases yeah. must have appeared. Yeah, I saw that today. I, and, that, mm. and those doctors were silenced. It really? was very. Oh yeah, Doctor Lee Wenliang. Oh, that guy. Yeah, he was detained and forced to sign a confession that I wrote about in MedPage oh, today. I saw that, yeah. And these doctors were heroes. They were trying to sound the alarm. Look, if you're a doctor at a hospital and you see someone from a virus lab come in with a deadly respiratory infection, mm. you're gonna sound the alarm. They were silenced. Mm. And so what, what we saw was uh, there's enough circumstantial evidence now. Mm. By the way, it's five miles away. What else do you need? Come on. Five miles of Wuhan. A major institute, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was resistant because I thought, you know, the people were talking about bioweapon and I thought that was, implausible, you know? Uh, yeah. And then I believe the scientists were saying, well, we looked at the genetic code and the code appears to be natural. I'm like, and and I understand you can look at insertions and things like that, but it's pretty easy to do that without, without that, that being a signature. That's right. It's not hard. So, you know, the other thought was like, did these lab workers actually pick it up in a cave, but you're saying they didn't find it in bats, but, and bring it back and accidentally release that way. Like, cause they do go on, on they pick up guano and things like that. Now, the bats were, the coronaviruses they were characterizing were clearly from bats. They were using Originally. bats in the lab, yeah. Right. So it may very well have been that COVID-19 was in the bat. Um, the other I thought is that it was manipulated in the lab. I, I don't know. Yeah. And, and it's probably out of my area of expertise. Yeah, but. me too. Do, do you think we should do a people's court, like a uh, civil lawsuit against the Chinese lab? And just be like, you know, dun dun dun, like Judge Wapner, <laughs> the, the the plaintiff, the world, dun 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 dun. You know, they claim that this Chinese lab released a plague upon all humanity, causing untold economic and human disaster. The defendant, dun 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 dun, just Wuhan lab, Wuhan lab with their frozen food. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, we believe it's from frozen peas. <laughs> yeah, it was peas. <laughs> Shipped from, where do they think it came from? Like oh, Europe or they thought it was. Yeah, they were blaming it on another country. Yeah, another like, country outside. Oh, it's China. Luxembourg. Luxembourg. They're filthy. <laughs> they're filthy people in Luxembourg. I mean, they're so dirty. Like, why would you ever trust a Luxembourgian uh, yeah. to not create a pandemic? Infected corn from Luxembourg. It's a well-known well, thing. It's a well-known thing. <laughs> I mean, it's run of the mill. It's like case closed. You don't even have to really, why send the WHO? And they're like, Luxembourg, of course. How much energy do you think is is it worth to try to understand the origins? I kind of think it's it doesn't matter. Yeah, I so mean, that, that's what I was going to say. It's like, in the end, it doesn't matter except to say, okay, well, Let's not do this kind of research without like hermetically sealed yeah. chambers. Yeah. yeah, why? That's the main thing. And then the second thing is like, it's not like you're gonna retribute against someone. You're just gonna say, okay, this was a colossal F up. Like, let's never do this again. And then let's still stop encroaching on like wild animals, like habitat and getting in their face and eating bat raw. Like that's probably a bad idea. So there's simple things, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's just kind of like common sense. I'm sure the international law people would love a, the world's biggest liability oh, case you imagine? in the history of the world. You get one of those emails, you are part of a class action suit as being yeah. homo sapiens. <laughs> and we could all get a check for four cents, uh, four cents. and these lawyers would it's, all be billionaires. It's four yuan. So it's, it's actually, <laughs> Even less than four cents. I want to be paid in Bitcoin. <laughs> Bitcoin? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Point zero 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 one of a Bitcoin. Uh, oh, that'd be great. It just goes right in your Bitcoin wallet. I need some Bitcoin. Don't we all? <laughs> Except when it goes to zero. But yeah, <laughs> apparently Elon Musk just said, well, what if I sell all my Bitcoin then? Because some Bitcoiners were giving him a hard time and the price of Bitcoin plummeted. I'm like, that's a pretty volatile, volatile coin there. It's an opportunity if you can take out two hours of your life to try to log on to Coinbase. I know, it's so painful. I tried it, I was like, I give up. I made Tom Heineber, my old producer, do it for me. I'm like, can you figure this out for me? <laughs> and I'm, by the way, I'm also uh, simultaneously working on a quantum computer to decrypt and make in value, let's just go to zero Bitcoin. Because once you decrypt it, then it's done. But you need like more computing than exists in the universe or something. Does it have AI? Oh. The quantum computer? Um. Of course it does. You have to write that on the description or you don't get funding. Don't you love that? Like, oh, you need AI in medicine. We just need I. We just need I. We just need I. We just need I. Just pure intelligence. Just. Um, by the way, in the like three minutes I had left, I had a guy on the show, uh, Federico Fagin. He um, was on the team that developed the first commercial microprocessor for Intel, the 4004. Uh -huh. And so he's a kind of Silicon Valley royalty. And he wrote a book that's on my desk there called Silicon. And in his um, piece, he said, okay, after he did this, he did he founded another company called Zilog that made this amazing processor that powered like all these early computers. And he's like a luminary in computer science, hmm. engineering physics. Ah, what's he think of quantum computing? So this is where it came, got interesting. So he spent the last 30 years trying to come up with AI solutions. He has a company called Syn Synaptics. And he was like, okay, how do we get these things to think like yeah. humans? And he's come to the conclusion that it will never happen because the world is not made of matter. It's made, it's conscious. And in the sort of quantum realm where it's all probabilistic and all of that, that's where these sort of indeterminate, like the, the kind of free will and all this exists. And that's where human intelligence lives because it's an intuited meaning-based sort of general intelligence. When you collapse all that into the classical world where it's all like determined, that's what computers are. There's no internal experience of a computer. There's no general intelligence. It does mechanical intelligence way better than we ever did. Mm. In fact, you can win chess because it's mechanical intelligence. It's like memorizing trillions of patterns, comparing them to the current situation 20,000 steps ahead of like Boris and <laughs> no Boris. problem. But then you get it to like it, a simple thing, like you showed an, a, a bunch of examples of like, okay, here are artificial driving car, don't crash into this. One violation, like a woman holding a baby that doesn't look like that, hmm. the computer cannot simply extrapolate. Ah. It just runs it over. Oh. Whereas all you gotta do to a human is go, don't hurt people or don't do bad and people will drive correctly. That's the difference. And it requires awareness, like the lights have to be on. Ah, so it's really fascinating. So this idea of artificial intelligence, you're right, we don't need that. It won't exist. It's intelligence, it's human intelligence. Now, Boris or whoever his name was, Kasparov, basically said something about artificial intelligence. He says, that computer would beat any human alive. And this applies to medicine, beat any human alive. Give me that computer as a tool and I will beat any computer and any human alive. That's 
the combination of human intelligence and, and mechanical intelligence. So mm. I think that's what we th should think about with medicine. Yeah. Make the tools that enable the human intelligence to shine. People want a human touch. Yeah. We can have all the tech out there behind us. People want to be reassured and touched when they're sick and told, we're going to take good care of you. Nailed it. And uh, that's a good way to wrap up the show, Marty. And I got to say this, I believe it was the late, great, he's not dead, Rick Springfield, who said, we all need somebody the human touch. Oh, well, close enough. <laughs> 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 you guys, Marty McCary, what a joy, man. Um, awesome oh man, you. the price we pay is out in paperback um, June 8th. Order it, order it, order it in paperback because we bumped this thing up on the New York Times bestseller list, ZPAC. It, all that does is this makes this go viral, which means we transform medicine and it's take, gonna take all of us. You want a voice? Just get the book, read it, be empowered. Go make a difference in the world. Marty, thank you for everything you do, brother. Great to be with you, my brother. Thank you, man. And we out. Peace. I don't know what that was. <laughs> <laughs> Become a subscriber. Click the subscribe button. Then right to the right of his little bell. Hit that bell. Booyah. You get notifications. Never miss any of our stuff. I love you guys. We out.